Welcome to All Things Moore County, Moore County's weekly radio show highlighting the many facets of the Sand Hills. That includes real estate, lifestyle, community and neighborhoods, and now from four properties, here's your host, Bill Sahadi. Good morning and welcome to the talk show, All Things Moore County. Uh, we have a... Um we have a special show today for a lot of reasons. Uh, for people who have listened to the show in the past, they'll know that one of the themes of the show has been talking about the arts in Moore County and highlighting students and um, all the indelible impressions that are created in the arts that um, people carry on as they go forward in their lives. Um, and we happen to be um, have one a guest here today who is going to share that experience with us who was a product of the Moore County um, uh, school system, and I'm talking about Grammy Award-winning baritone Lucas Meacham. Um, he graduated Union Pines in 95 or 96, um, went on to App State, um, had been to Yale, had um, trained, uh, not, I guess, as a opera singer early on, but sort of evolved into it. Um, I think in his early years, he wanted to be Billy Joel or a queen, um, and uh, as his voice matured, um, he has, uh, he's won a Grammy, um, worldwide fame, and he just finished a stint um, at UNC as the artist in residence. Um, and I want to be able to um, have a conversation with him. He's in town for a couple of days. And we also asked a friend of ours, Keegan Foyles, who is a senior at Pinecrest High School, to come and join us. Keegan um, was nominated for uh, and auditioned for and was accepted to the North Carolina Governor's School in 2017 for choral music. She just received a full tuition scholarship to Methodist University. Um, she rewrote Pinecrest's alma mater. I didn't know that. And um, she's an honor student um, and one of the um, most talented young ladies you'll ever want to meet. And I wanted Lucas to meet her. Uh, you can look across the table, Lucas, and maybe see yourself 20, 23 years ago, huh? Absolutely. Good morning. You, your family still lives here in Moore County? My family lives 10 minutes from here. Is that right? Yeah. You don't sound like you're from the South? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I lost a bit of my accent through my travels and everything. And I haven't lived in the state since I was in college, you know. So I, I've... Uh, I do dedicate a small portion of my brain to not sounding very Southern at some occasions. And this, this actually happened a long time ago where when I first left the state to go to the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, I would speak to people and rather than them responding to me, they'd say, you really talk like that. <laughs> and so I was kind of embarrassed into losing my accent. Right. And now I kind of regret it in a lot of ways right. uh, because it's, it's part of who I am. But at the time, I wasn't quite confident enough just to tell them to you know, go on somewhere else and I'm just going to do what I do. And, uh, but I, I have to say there is a certain level of, um, class that you have to bring to the, that the opera world expects from you and to have a thick Southern accent. Sometimes it does, whether it should or not work against you. Right. When you, um, left Moore County and you got out of high school, did you ever imagine you would be in this position 22 or 23 years later? Oh, absolutely not. There's no, no, not at all. I, I really kind of flew by the seat of my pants, but I did. I was a vocal performance major from the very beginning of when I, <laughs> when I began uh, my university studies. So right. as soon as I went to school, I was, a, I was actually a double major. I was a music ed major and a vocal performance major. And around my junior year, I got to go to the first day of student teaching and I went and I worked with the kids, with the teacher there, and it was a big, long day. And at the end of that day, I dropped my double major because I realized I, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's either singing for me or I'm going to flip burgers at Hardee's or make biscuits at Biscuitville or something like that. So, uh, yeah. Did you have any, um, any thoughts about um, going to college and, you know, pursuing music, but then getting a real job in the real world? Yeah, well, what, what's so great sitting across from Keegan right now is I do see a lot of myself in her, you right. know, that she's just starting out. And in a lot of ways, I'm really jealous of what you're going to be doing because it's so exciting. You know, you've got a full scholarship to go to school and it's just you're, you're just right at the beginning of your journey. And so it's nice to sort of have this, 
this mirror, this, well, this, this what, maybe five-year-old mirror. No, <laughs> I'm just joking with five years. Anyway, a, a few years ago mirror, you know, looking back at me right now. So That's I don't right. know. It's really, it's really like cool to see. like looking at a mirror, see. except she's a lot prettier than you are. Yeah, well, I won't argue with that. <laughs> um, Christy Holland wrote an article about you a couple of years ago, a, be- a very well-written article that kind great. of captured your inspiration, how you got involved in music. Um, you were fans. You did some four-part harmonies. You oh, played yeah. around with... Um, who are some of your favorite uh, vocalists and inspirational artists? Well, back in high school, it was it was Prince. It was Boys to Men. It was Queen. It was Journey. It was... Uh, it was... Uh, right. I, I don't know. Some. I don't know. Keegan, maybe you know half these people. <laughs> but, uh, I know all those you people. You know, okay, <laughs> great. Okay, great. All right, good. I'm glad to know it's not so uh, irrelevant now. But honestly, the, the biggest thing that I got in the beginning when I was in high school school is from singing was confidence because I didn't have a lot of confidence in high school and I mean you look at me now and you think this guy's got it together and and I, I don't get me wrong I still feel like I'm, I'm working towards the goal of you know good singing every day uh, but back then I was really I, I was a little overweight I had crooked teeth I had acne and I just didn't feel so confident in myself all the time and I feel like a lot of people can relate to that sort of thing especially in in, in, in your formative years and so what singing really gave me was that shot in the arm of confidence and it boosted my morale and, and I didn't have to feel self-conscious about myself when I was doing something that I, would, I felt so good about. Keegan, does, does music for you do the same thing? Does it give you confidence? Um, wh- how, what was your inspiration? Um, well, music eventually did give me confidence for a while there. It was a big source of anxiety for me and so... I kind of had to learn how to work through that and inspiration for music is mostly the people around me because I've grown up with it so much. So my mom, Terry Sinclair, Aaron Slink, all those people have, are mostly my inspiration. I find it in them instead of Prince and. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, I remember when I was a senior in high school, I could. I mean, I didn't even cast a shadow in the mirror, so both of you were like years ahead of me. I didn't know what I wanted to do. You didn't even cast a shadow in the mirror. No. I love that. You like that one? I love that, yeah. You can probably use that in one of your videos. I, well, I cast a shower. I cast a shadow in every mirror I pass now. So. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, you do. You were, um, earlier this week, you were at the Sunrise Theater. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that event? Absolutely. Well, it was a recital that I gave with my wife, and she is a pianist herself. She is a collaborative pianist with a master's degree from Florida State. And we travel the world together. And um, the biggest news I have to say about us is that we're expecting our first child in June. Oh, wow. And it's just the most amazing journey, the most amazing experience. And everybody says you have no clue what's coming your way. It's right. our first child. And and so I, already it's amazing to me. But people say it gets even crazier <laughs> once it's uh, right there in front of you. You travel what percent of the year? Probably 10, 10 months out of 12. Jeez. Together? Oh, yeah, together. Um, that could could change with the baby? Nope, not no? a bit. <laughs> it can't change if I'm going to put diapers on the baby. It's just that's the career. Wow. So, yeah, uh, every company uh, sort of exists in a, in a big city or a, even a midi- medium or small city around the world. Um, and they hire me. So the opera world works like this. You get hired on an individual contract basis to go and sing one part in one show. And once that show is over, it runs for a month to two months. Once that show is over, you're on to the next city. And so that's why I travel so much is because there's no year, well, they're not, they're not any American year round contracts to just sing opera. And so it's really gig to gig for me. And so it's a lot of travel. But at this point, it's the lifestyle I'm accustomed to. So what would be weird for me yeah. is going to an office from nine to five and having weekends off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, um, you call a home Minneapolis. Yes. How did you get to uh, Minneapolis? Well, my wife is from there. You and just answer the question. Absolutely, it's it's <laughs> it's it's an easy question to answer because I want I wanted to make her happy, really, and she gave up a lot to be able to travel with me because she had her own career going on at the same time as I was having mine, and all of a sudden our stars collided, and uh, it was just the most amazing thing that ever happened to me. And she, she, I told her, I said, if please you maybe come with me everywhere I go. We'll live anywhere in the world you want to live. And so now my furniture lives in Minneapolis. Gotcha. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, play a clip 
from uh, Ghost of Versailles. I want people to hear a little bit about um, about you, and we actually have a clip of Keegan. We're going to play later in the show as well. Um, so, Christy, if it's possible, can we um, just switch over to Ghost of Versailles? Well, let me tell you a little bit about this, if they don't mind. Set this it is, up. Yeah, this is this is a, a piece by John Corigliano, the Ghost of Versailles, and if you know the Marriage of Figaro or the Barber of Seville, kind of like. The Lord of the Rings, it's a trilogy, or Star Wars or something like that. It's a trilogy, and this is the third installment of that trilogy written by uh, Beaumarchais. So this piece is is also the piece that I won a Grammy for. So you're hearing a Grammy-winning performance of this piece right now. That's a, a great setup. Thanks. Let's listen. <laughs> What do you think as you were listening to the piece you were smiling oh yeah this piece it just brings back such great memories for me doing this you know and having won the grammy for it is just the icing on the take on the cake but uh but th this piece you might have noticed as you're listening at home it's in english and it's it's actually a modern opera that was written <laughs> about 30 years ago so it's it's a pretty recent opera in the repertoire and what most people probably are used to when they hear opera is operas that are hundred years hundreds or more years old right and by mozart or puccini or verdi and uh, so it's it's a bit of a, a different thing. We um, prior to meeting with you, um, Keegan and I both um, we looked at YouTube. Um, we looked at a couple of your performances and a couple of what I like to call your tutorials. Oh yeah, for, right. Um, not only on eating, but on training. Mm -hmm. um, he makes music fun, doesn't he, Keegan? He does. <laughs> Yeah, I actually watched one of your videos in preparation for my college audition before I really knew on French vowels. Yeah. Yeah. So. What did you learn? Well, I learned. <laughs> all right. Now school's in session. <laughs> well, I learned all about the resonance that you have to use in order to get those vowels across while still like sounding French. But yeah, yeah that was the hardest part. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a constant struggle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. One of the things um, you both have in common um, you both perform the uh, Star Spangled Banner. And I saw Keegan perform it. Um, it was at the football field. And oh, <laughs> it was, long time ago. St well, stunning, but a lot of courage. Um, you were 15 probably at the time. 14. Yeah. Yeah. And you performed it at a similar venue, Madison Square Garden. <laughs> no, no difference. Potato, potato. Yeah. <laughs> so growing up in Brooklyn, right, I was a hockey fan. Yeah. And I used to go to the garden. Yeah. And you go to a hockey game and you don't expect to get a lot of silence from the people who are coming to watch the game. Yeah. The place was mesmerized. They enjoyed it. I had the blast, though. It was so much that fun. That must have been a thrill. Oh, God, I love that. And what's kind of funny about singing the national anthem at a bunch, because I've sung it at a lot of major, you know, national, what do they call them? Professional sporting events. Right. And I've, I've done it quite a bit. And... It used to be the thing that my family was most, my excuse me, my extended family was most proud of was me doing that when I was singing in Vienna and London and Paris and New York at the biggest opera houses in the world. Right. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing this at this opera house. And they're like, wait, are you doing another national anthem? And I'm like, well, yes, I am that too. <laughs> you know what I notice when people sing the national anthem? The, the people in the stands can't wait to start clapping. Oh, yeah. And they start before you're, you're finished. Yeah. When you finished, the place was silent. You could hear a pin drop. Yeah. And they canceled the hockey game. That's how <laughs> yeah, everybody went home after that. I mean, <laughs> they just gave New York the win. <laughs> um, you have a lot of fun with your music, though, too. Um, it, your singing. It's not um, opera. You make it fun. Um, there was a, a comedian who made comedy fun, Jim Carrey. He's yeah. a very physical comedian. Uh, you might be the Jim Carrey of opera. Um, 
I normally think of myself more as the Brad Pitt of opera, but Jim Carrey, I, I see the, I see the, uh, I see the correlation. Here. Um, you put a lot of personality into your videos, um, and you you make it um, for everyone to enjoy. I mean, you're very personal. You you have a bit of um, like a Michael Bublé vibe, and you, you have a lot of personality when you're out there. You're really enjoying it. Yeah. Well, the biggest difference between me and Michael Bublé is that he's not here. If, okay, yes. Actually, that probably is the biggest difference. <laughs> the, excuse me. The second biggest difference is that uh, the, the unique thing about opera is that we never use microphones except when we're making a recording. But even then, they're normally floor mics or mics that are sort of out from us. There is never any amplification in an opera house. And that's why you have to train. I mean, I went to school for eight years, three different colleges, two years of internship, all so that I could make a sound learn to make a sound that carries over a hundred piece orchestra and a hundred chorus members and everything else to a theater that seats 4,000 people. And so that's a big difference between Michael Bublé and I is that he sings into a microphone, he right. can croon all day long. But for me, right. it's more like an Olympic event opera singing because you have to take the unamplified human voice and use it in such a way that it carries into a hall. I, I did not know that. that. And you did a video on um, how you train. Um, it's important to you mean be working out, working out, yeah. and, and keeping your neck uh, comfortable and safe. Oh yeah, you don't want any neck tension when you're working out. We made that video in Madrid, actually. So it's like all these videos—they're never from any one spot. They're just wherever we happen to be in the world. My wife and I. Keegan, did you see the video that he did where he was showing people how he warmed up his voice from the minute he got up in the morning, I guess, till the evening you were going to perform? Yeah, it was crazy. You started with your your puckering and your breathing, lip drills. Huh? Lip trills. <laughs> lip trills, just like that. <laughs> Super important. I started today with lip trills. I start almost every day of my life with lip trills because it's, well, I don't want to get too technical. It's just, it's important for singers. Um, we're going to come back. We're going to come back in the second set. Our guest for the show is Lucas Meacham, and we are joined by Keegan Foyles. And um, we want to come back and talk a little bit about the arts, what it meant to you, to uh, some of your inspirations in Moore County as teachers. Uh, this is all things Moore County. We'll be right back. back are we here we are on okay we're back for the second set of all things more county uh lucas meacham is our guest keegan foils um was great to get out of school today we're so happy <laughs> um to have you come and join us um lucas i bragged on keegan a little bit um uh, she's going to be leaving us as, after she graduates this year but um we were able to get a clip i'd love you to hear it um i can't wait yeah and um We'll put her through the um, the grill afterwards. There you go. We'll put her through the ringer, especially if she's playing hooky from school. Today. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Can you imagine? Yeah. She's driven by her passion, not by her school. No. That, I can relate to that 100%. Right. Um, so let's take a listen to, um, this is Keegan Foyles, I think joined by your sisters, Caden and Lauren. Yes, sir. Okay. Here we go. You were able to hear that? It was beautiful. Huh? Uh, how old are your sisters, Keegan? My sisters are f 15. Okay. Um, they just turned 15 about a month ago. Okay. Freshman in high school, so. You were asking her uh, what part she was, and you said yeah, the top, and she, she said, said yes. Yeah, part, yeah. I don't know what that means. Well, it was <laughs> it was in three-part harmony, and, and so there were different, different levels to it. Yeah, right. and so she was the soprano part, the highest part. Right. Um, it takes you back? 
to the time you were at her age? Uh, it does in a lot of ways. I Except I didn't have siblings that were talented like that. <laughs> Excuse me. They were talented in their own ways. Oh, God. Sorry if you're listening. I love you very much. Uh, no, they were talented in, the, in their way for sure. But I had a four-track recording machine, yeah. and I had to record myself, then go back and record mm -hmm. over myself, and then go back and record over that. So I would end up with four to six-part harmony of me singing every single part which actually worked out really well for my future because I learned how to sing lots of different harmony parts and how to memorize a part very well. Uh, today you've updated some of those four-part harmonies, uh, and if anyone wants to go on YouTube, they can see a whole host of your four-part. You do a couple of Christmas carols? The Christmas carols, yeah, that's kind of hearkening back to my time in high school, just like you, you know, it's just... You should check these out. They're really fun, <laughs> actually. And it, it started just because I, I thought... I miss doing this. And I, I found on my computer, my Mac, that I had GarageBand. And I was like, well, let me see. I can, and I literally the first one is just me singing into the microphone on my computer. Like this is three years ago. And then I did Silent Night, the arrangement by Boys to Men, which is fantastic. And then fast forward a couple of years, I've gotten really into it. And I spent 10 hours in a sound studio doing the last one, which is Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas, an arrangement that, that I wrote myself. And the video editing was all done by my wife. Is your wife the your videographer? I don't know what the title is because there there's some guru. Pretty, I think is what you're looking for. She's very talented. Yeah, she's she's a guru in so many ways. Yes. There's a there's a definite vibe in your videos. Uh, there's one where you're doing four part harmony and you snap your fingers and all of a sudden your outfit changes. Uh huh. I, I think I'm getting the right one. It, just cute, just catchy. Yeah, it's it's fun and I mean we end up having you know about what half a million views and and yeah people people seem to really like it. I have to say, and it's more, you know, but I don't do it for anyone but myself, really. It's just something fun that harkens back to a day when I was young and footloose and fancy free, you know? <laughs> Doesn't it help to, um, you mentioned the three tenors as one of your earlier, earliest inspirations. But doesn't the video world today, doesn't it help you um, build your brand, who you are, what you do? Uh, it does definitely personalize you. It, it does, and it, it, it helps as much as it not hurts, but it, it it's a job. It's it's a job that never ends. So I you know I, I come off the stage at night and I've sung in front of a thousand you know four thousand people, and I take my wig and my costume off and everything. And uh, this is not a wig, by the way. And uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, but so anyway, I get out of my costume and then I go home and I have other work to do. The work doesn't end at the opera house like it used to with this whole social media thing. The work. It almost never stops. We went on vacation, you know, when we were in New York. I was at the Met before this, had a few days off, and thought, I'm just going to relax and sit next to this stream, you know. And, of course, the social media thing just creeps in, and you have to do stories about it, and you have to tell about it. And so, I don't know. It's, it, it never ends in a good way and in a, in a, in a, in a very work-filled way. Yeah. For anybody that wants to familiarize himself with Luke, Lucas's work, um, really, go to YouTube. There's some great videos um, of his past performances and some videos where you're having a lot of fun with the music that you love and it shows. Yeah, if you just type in Lucas Opera, it's like that kind oh. of, I'm kind of the guy, you you're, know, you're for, the guy. for the Lucas Opera Google search anyway. He, he's the guy. <laughs> that was a yeah. Tom Cruise line in the movie Night and Day with Cameron Diaz. You're, really? I'm the guy? I'm the, yeah. I'm the guy. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> Don't pay attention to yeah. me. Oh. There was an article <clears throat> I had printed out. It's called Ordinary People Focus on the Outcome. Extraordinary people focus on the process. Mm. Um, it was from the ascentpub.com, written by Anthony Moore. And it talks about, um, seems what a lot of what you were talking about to the Union Pines High School in one of your videos um, about the hard work and the processing and the passion and trying to do what you love um, as an inspiration to you know, students like Keegan's age. Well, passion is step one, you know, a love for something is step one. And, and I got some really good advice from my father when I was trying to decide what I'm going to do. And he said, do what it is that gives you chills. And if you can make money doing that, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's exactly what I've done. And I've been fortunate to do so. And I mean, again, I, I, it was no easy process. There was a lot of sacrifice, but when, when you're doing something you love, the sacrifice just feels like the next step. Right. Right. And, it, and your resilience comes from 
just your commitment and your passion because you, you just never gave up. You just kept going. And you didn't have siblings to work with you. You were doing it all on your own. Yeah. And uh, well, for high school, yeah, that, that's exactly what it was. But as soon as I reached college, I had a few other people like Keegan, you know, you have some people yeah. at home to help you out. And that's wonderful that you have a similar passion with them. And you're in a perfect spot. Your voice is really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. And really, it's, it's exactly where you sound like you should. You know, I'm not going to analyze, you know, your singing as though you're 30 years old and have a career. I'm going to analyze your singing right where you are. And a lot of singers, young singers, make this mistake. I did the same as I made this mistake. When I was uh, in my second college, this was the Eastman School of Music, my voice teacher finished, I finished the song. He said, Lucas, you're perfect. And I said, I don't sound like these, I could name all the famous baritones, but you <laughs> might not know who they are. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not as good as, as Brent Turfel. I'm not good as Dmitry Borstovsky. I don't sound like Cheryl Milnes. I don't sound like these guys. And I was perfect for a 22-year-old baritone. And you are perfect for where you are. Thank you. What happens to your voice from your 20s to your 30s? A lot of change. You kind of, I mean, there's kind of a, there's kind of a process through 20s to 30s, but the, the biggest thing is you learn a lot about what you need to do to, in order to make the best sound in a house. And that's, that's the ultimate thing, you know? I mean, from 20 to 30, you're learning music history, you're learning theory, you're learning listening skills, you're learning how to be on stage, stagecraft, I, I mean, to, to acting, to, to fighting choreography. You know, you're learning literally everything there is about the business, also that when you, you master that, in the moment of performing, you can forget all of it and just be natural on stage. And know that you worked so hard to get to that point, learning all those things, that it's okay to let go and just be you. Mm -hmm. Um, you told a story about your uh, Grammy. Um, let's go back to that for a minute. Oh, so a subject I hate to talk about. I know. <laughs> let's try and drag it out of you. Yeah, right. So, um, oh, the Grammy. Let me tell. Let me tell you. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you were in line. You were standing with Adele. Uh, so oh, yeah. you said, "Tell tell us that story." Well, so when you, as you do when you go to the Grammys, you get off in the red carpets there, and they say, "Okay, uh, nominees this way," and Everyone. plebeians this way you know everyone else right. this way and so i was like nominee right here you know and so of course before i won and so i'm walking around the thing it wasn't just adele there were they were like there were famous people everywhere there was ryan seacrest doing the interviews like right there and i was like oh my god this is crazy you know and and, and every other you know etv every other television show doing their interviews and stuff and so i'm in the line by myself and i'm just like you know i had a nice i look i look pretty good pretty dapper and um and i'm in line and i'm like now i'm the second person in, in the line uh, that's about to go. There's one person in front of me who actually ended up being some other famous... Camilla Cabello. What's her name? Camilla Cabello. Camilla Cabello was right in front of me. I didn't know who she was. She actually wasn't as famous at the time, but anyway, she's now really... Do you know who she is? <laughs> anyway, okay, I thought maybe, oh, it's a generational thing. I didn't know who she was. So uh, all of a sudden, the world stops at the Grammys, and in comes this... I mean, the, the, you you hear you feel the wind coming before you, you felt <laughs> anything else, and it was this entourage with Adele, and the line was to these 30 photographers that took pictures of every nominee. And so in comes Adele, and there's just this, you know, hubbub. And so Adele comes in and stands right where I'm about to stand. And, and you know, she, of course, looks over at me, winks, and say, hey, Lucas, pleasure to see you again. No, that didn't, that didn't happen. But, um, no, she, so, you know, she gets all her pictures taken, then off she goes, you know. And then it's back to business as usual, just taking your picture for being nominated for a Grammy. So from the Grammy, um, I want to go back to a quote. Uh, that is attributed to you. To me, you said a child that grows up without arts education should be considered a failed opportunity at the hands of the state. Did I say that? That's what, yeah. Uh, the arts bring <laughs> color to life, to experiences, to the mundane. If we give up on the children of North Carolina, we give up on our future. The high school choir teacher who inspired me to pursue a career wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have existed had I not um, known him and I wouldn't be who I am today without their help. Um, I, I, I'm segueing a little bit, but um, you won a Grammy. It, start, it had to start somewhere. It was very um, organic and it grew. Um, your mom was a teacher, I yeah. think, and, um, um, and the plight in North Carolina with funding for the arts, it's tough. Every year it gets tougher and tougher, but the arts make a difference in a student's life. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the arts shape us as, as human beings. And it doesn't have to be highfalutin classical music. If you love country music and that's, that makes you happy, right. then that's the best music in the world. 
That is the best genre of music in the world. If you love rap music and that makes you happy, that is the best genre of music in the world for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And so I'm I'm all about encouraging people to just enjoy music and art. If you see something that's beautiful, you know, and enjoy it and take a moment to appreciate it. I mean, there there's a, a, one of my favorite things that somebody said about the arts was Winston Churchill when during World War II when the bombings began in London, and he said. They said, we need to shut down the theaters. We need to shut down the theater district. You know, that was right before the bombings began. But he said, if we shut down the theaters, then what are we fighting for? And I think that really represents art on a high level. It, it, it represents it very well because it says that this, the human endeavor is there for us to enjoy at the end of the day. People don't work 40 hours a week, 60 hours, 70 hours a week. They don't work 70 hours a week so they can just go home and go to bed. You know, they work 70 hours a week so that they can enjoy themselves. They can enjoy their life at some point. It's always moving towards the goal of enjoying your life and and using what you've worked so hard to help your children and help yourself to have a better place on the earth. And so Mm -hmm. that better place comes from culture Mm -hmm. and the arts, Mm -hmm. be it it culinary culture, be it the food you eat, be it the music you listen to, be it the museum you go to and enjoy. Or even if it's a sports event, there, there's, there is a bit of a crossover there between those things. You know, if you're passionate about something, that just needs to live inside of you and, and you need to shine that passage, passion out into the world. Yeah. Even if you're just sitting on the UNC sidelines, screaming your face off because you want them to win, you know, that's passion. That is passion. Right, right. Keegan, you are, um, you are so fortunate to have that passion. Uh, there are a lot of kids your age who don't have that passion and they just, you know, get up every day and go, well, what's the day going to give me? Um, and it's a gift, um, and what you do with it is is um, is a challenge and an adventure, um, and it is great to see her at such a formative age in this position. I think. Yeah. Do you feel that when you sing? Yes, sir. I do. Yeah. <laughs> it's that bubbly. I'm, I'm honestly feeling it right now, talking about it. It's that little thing that's just this little butterflies in your stomach. I'm. I, yeah, I'm literally feeling it right now. Yeah. Isn't it too bad that she doesn't have a beautiful smile? Well, yeah. I mean, what is she going to do? I, I mean, know. She doesn't emanate it. I mean, just she radiates as I she walks in the room. Her next interview needs to be on TV so everyone at home can see this beautiful smile. I, I, I think, think we're so. a ways off from that. Yeah. Um. <laughs> hey, I want to um, – we're going to play – is it a, set this up for me. Oh, yeah. This we is like to play a clip one from clip. the opera Iolanta by Tchaikovsky. Thank you. Being from Brooklyn, I have a hard time with some of the pronunciations. I can't it's, help it. It's not Brooklyn. It's the fact that this is a Russian opera, <laughs> and it's in Russian, so don't feel bad. Thank you for saving me. Of course. Um, let's listen to Lucas Meacham. I know you're great. We could play a lot of different clips. What do you think of that one? Uh, it's just, a, you know, it takes me, all these clips just take me back to the moment that I did the, the roles, you know? Right. And that's what's cool as a performer is you, you literally relive the moment yeah. that we recorded this in Germany, you know? I mean, we were there and, and, and a cool thing about this is that we actually toured this piece around and we didn't know if we were going to record it or not, but the tour went so well right. that they decided that Deutsche Grammophon actually, which is a... a a famous classical music label picked it up and said, we want to record this because everybody's so great in it. Yeah. And it's with the great Russian soprano, Anna Trebko, yeah. who is probably the best singer in the world right now. Well, um, it's been a pleasure to have you, but I wanted to, um, one last thing, being home in Moore County, you were up at UNC for about a week mm-hmm. as an artist in residence. Uh, what's it like to be home? Your mom is here with you? It's... You know, I, I I get off the plane and I breathe in the Carolina pine tree air, and it just it it, it feels like home. Yeah. I, just the air here yeah. feels like home. You know, even the cold air that we're experiencing now. But it's just, I don't know, man. It's just it's yeah. just being home is just being home. I get to sleep in my mom's house, and I get to eat all her delicious food. I get to go around and just, I mean, just walking around, it just feels peaceful here. Well, we're delighted that you could come in and talk with us. Um, Keegan, I'm delighted that you can come in and join us. Thank you for having me. And we want to have you back. 
Lucas isn't going to be here for a while, but we're going to have her come back and do a show sometime before she graduates high school so she can go over all her accomplishments because they're impressive. I can't and, wait to hear the more recordings of you. <laughs> thank you. And I'm jealous. I wasn't like that in high school. We're going to we're going to do that. Lucas, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. You got it. Thank I, you. I appreciate it. Keegan, thank you so much. Back to our uh, third and final set of All Things Moore County. We, um, we enjoyed talking with Lucas Meacham in the first two sets, and uh, we had a very gifted um, student and friend of ours, Keegan Foyles, who is here, who has received a scholarship and had the opportunity to sit opposite Lucas and converse with him, and what a great experience for her. In keeping with the same theme of the show, we're shifting gears a little bit, and three of, of Keegan's classmates are here. Uh, they're representing the Pinecrest players, and they're here to talk about the Rogers and Hammersteins. And I always say Hammerstein instead of Hammerstein. Um, Cinderella, which is going to be uh, at the Robert E. Lee Auditorium on Friday, March 15th, and Saturday, March 16th at 7 p.m., and a 2 o'clock matinee on the 17th of March. With me is Alexa Castro Giovanni, who is playing Cinderella. Uh, Aiden Peters, who's playing the Madame, Madame, and Cara Blue, who is the stage manager. And uh, we got to talk a little bit um, before the taping about some of the things that you're going to be doing. And Cara, I just want to start very briefly with you. Okay. She, she, and you were shy when you said hello before, oh. but I think you're going to be fine. <laughs> so you work behind the scenes. I do. It's a technical position. It is a technical position. And Pinecrest Players is set up to have the actors and the actresses, but also to train the people who are going to run the production because it's vitally important. Yes, sir. Is this the first production you've been involved in? Uh, no. Well, I've been doing a uh, Pinecrest show since I was a freshman, but I started to get into more of tech when okay. I was a junior. I'm a senior now. Were you involved in last year's? Um, I was. The Adams yeah. family. I was the costume manager, and then I was also Grandma Adams in the show. Oh, you were. I was. Okay. <laughs> so I saw the show. It was a great show. Thank you. Um, and everyone looks at the actors and the actresses, mm -hmm. but you're here to tell us that there's a lot going on in the background there to make, it, make yeah. it all possible. Mm -hmm. um, so this is how many productions now for you? From Pinecrest, oh, mm, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're an nine, old pro. Ten, yeah. Maybe ten, I think. Yeah, and you're an old pro. <laughs> um, so a lot of work involved. Yeah, a lot of work involved. How long have you all been training for Cinderella? Cinderella, it takes about like two, maybe three months for a show to put a show together. Okay. So we've been working on it since maybe Jan maybe a little bit in December. Yeah. January. Well, well, you guys, I know you're in between rehearsals and mm -hmm. you came in to do this. Um, and I'm just going to go around the table left to right. Yeah. Aiden Peters, you're a senior? Yes, I am. So you're all classmates of Keegan's? Yes, yes. And um, uh, this is a musical. Mm. People mm -hmm. need to know that. So there's a lot of singing. There, there is. Uh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of singing. A lot of even just instrumental music yeah. is really something. It's, it's beautiful. So you can get distracted by that while we're dancing. So all, yes. the, <laughs> all the participants in the show are Pinecrest students with the exception of maybe some of the orchestra, some of the musicians? Yes, in the pit we have students in with some teachers, our um, orchestra teacher and our band teacher, and then some professionals from the community also come in to help out with that. The spring musical is a Pinecrest player's biggest event of the year? Yes. Yeah, I'd say so. Okay. As I turn around the table, I want to introduce Alexa. Um, I had a cousin named Alexis, so I'm partial to that <laughs> name. Uh, you're playing Cinderella. Yes. Um, were you in the Adams Family last year? I was in the Adams Family last year. Okay. I actually um, understudied the lead character, Wednesday Adams. Okay. And I was in the ensemble. I was a flapper. And I also okay. was uh, Fester's love interest, the moon. And I had a special dancing role. Okay. I, I remember the costumes were incredible. And it was it was hard to tell sometimes who was who, mm -hmm. but they were great. Um, <laughs> my guess is the costumes are going to be every bit as impressive this time around. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Especially with the amount of magic 
that is involved with this show. Um, I mean, they're beautiful. They're absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful, some of these costumes. And uh, we're fortunate to work with uh, Mary and Marcy, Marcy yeah. of Showboat Costumes mm -hmm. um, to help with rentals. And we've been getting fittings, and Kara's yeah. been keeping track of it all. Yeah, even working closely with them, we're really grateful for their uh, service. Just yeah. last week, I think, it, I, the three of us uh, went and checked out our costumes. It was mm -hmm. yeah. a great time. There's some yeah. complicated, intricate yeah. pieces, but uh, it's, but that's it's what's so exciting. It's the magic behind the show. Yes. So. Um, so, Kara, I have to say, you speak softly and carry a pretty big stick. She. <laughs> She's got the power when you speak. You soft. <laughs> you come right out. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, she just caught me right off guard. Um, that just embarrassed you. No. Um, tell me, tell me about. It was a compliment. Thank you. Tell me about the teamwork that goes into a production like this and the support that you have to give each other. Well, oh, okay. okay. I would say well because as we were talking about before. Uh, we have like our technical theater like side of theater and then we have like the actors but i mean we all work together and everything like actors help backstage um and so and we have our different crews so we have like costumes lighting shop uh props and we all work together to create everything that we work with and it's really about teamwork um Aiden, we do think? yeah we are definitely split up into we specialize um my i specialize in lighting kara is the costume head in, normally in the class, but it is very much an all hands on deck situation, mm -hmm. especially <laughs> around now with the musical. It's do find who you can help, uh, do what you can. It's it's a very exciting environment for that reason. It's yeah, uh, very, you know, let's let's get this done. Let's push to the end. You guys are less than a week away from the first show. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, nerves? Oh are we are um, we nervous? Are we uh, excited? We're excited. We I are feel ready. I feel like we're so on a good, excited. Yeah, we're on a good track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it always comes, you know, it, even throughout the rehearsal process, it's abstract, like right up until this point, and you start seeing the sets come together, and you start seeing the scenes come mm -hmm. together, and like we just yesterday ran all of Act One for the first time, so you can start to follow what's yeah. actually happening and not it's just coming like, together. Really well. oh, I'm gonna come in and do this part, and then other things are gonna happen, but yeah, it's it's starting to feel real. Back to the <clears throat> um, Alexa team. Back to the teamwork uh, question. Mm -hmm. I actually had the opportunity last week, I snuck into the Pitts rehearsals um, just to listen and to see how beautiful it is because I'm actively involved with choir and uh, theater and technical theater, but a lot of people don't realize that this is all live music coming from all these different mm -hmm. students and teachers and community members and it's amazing what they can put together because mm -hmm. um, a lot of places around here even professional theaters use pre-recorded tracks they don't have a live pit and that's so amazing and i think that makes our production very very special mm -hmm. and i was listening to them last week and it was absolutely amazing and now tomorrow we have something called uh sits probe which mm -hmm. is a german word for it literally tr roughly translates to sit and sing and that's when for the first time the actors uh get to come together with the pit and orchestra and mm -hmm. we just sing through and play through the entire show and so it's something really special. And I think once you get to listen to it all come together, that's when it really hits and the excitement yeah. just keeps amping up until show week. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's when you really start to feel like the show conditions start happen, yeah. start to come on. When we had uh, Lucas Meacham on, <clears throat> he was a student at Union Pines High School. His mom was a teacher um, in the school system. And he spoke about funding for the arts and how difficult it is. But he. Mm -hmm. He remembered back to his choir director in high school and said, you know, if it wasn't for him or her, I, I don't remember if it was a he or she, he might never have evolved to, to be a, an opera singer where he was. Mm -hmm. So the teachers, the um, mentors um, that are there for you, I mean, will create indelible impressions and, and you'll never forget. But the funding and raising monies to do these productions you have to do it sort of in an organic way. It's, it's, the monies just aren't there. 
Yeah, we are completely self-funded in terms of our theater department and even our choir, orchestra, and band. We are, all yeah. of our arts departments are self-funded. So each um, organization within the arts department has their own booster club. So mm -hmm. Pinecrest Players has their boosters. Uh, the Pinecrest Choirs has their own boosters and the band has their own boosters and so does orchestra. So um, we work really hard because we really do not get funding from... So mom and the parents take a, a big role in mm -hmm. helping. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. That got a unanimous yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. um, tell me very quickly about some of the music that's going to be... You're going to be singing quite a bit? I will be like singing that. quite a bit. I think uh, I counted the other day, and in terms of major songs and even a couple of the little bits in between, I have 17 numbers between Act 1 and Act 2 in wow. terms of just singing. Wow. Um, and the music is unreal. Roger and Hammerstein has an uh, incredible reputation right. in the musical theater world and even the classical world for their compositions and the music is stunning and the amount of detail that goes into the music when certain characters appear you'll hear repeats yeah. of certain uh motifs. parts of the show yeah, and motifs and those, yeah. yep everyone should come out and look it's one of the first rites of spring it's mm -hmm. your spring classic your, your number one production of the year it's going to be friday and saturday evenings march 15th and 16th at the robert e lee auditorium uh, there's a matinee on Sunday at 2 p.m. on the 17th. Ticket prices, adults are $15, students are $10. Um, and I hope you guys pack the uh, auditorium. And I hope all your hard work um, gets realized um, and you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Alexa, Aiden, Kara. I appreciate you guys coming in. Now go back and get back to work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a great week. This is All Things More County.